Okay, so I'd like to now introduce uh, our second speaker of the day, which is Matt Lyons, Senior Vice President and Global Trading Manager of Capital Group. So welcome to the stage, Matt. Uh, I was going to have a prepared statement in French about thanking everyone for coming, but I butchered it a few times at home today, so I'll just start with bonjour. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Trade Tech for inviting me to say a few words here um, to kick off this event today. I think it's a great opportunity to talk about some of the issues that we think about at the Capital Group and maybe describe some of the initiatives that we have underway to kind of solve some of the dilemmas I think that face buy-side traders and, and hopefully focus in on technology to make uh, uh, us be more efficient in the way we try to implement portfolio decisions. Um, of course, it's also a great opportunity for my wife to hit the shops here in Paris and do a little damage as well. So, appreciate for that. Um, I, I've looked at the at the uh, agenda. It looks like there's some great topics. I'm really looking forward to uh, participating and hearing a lot of the discussions in the next couple of days. I think it's a great opportunity for us to uh, to learn from what other people are doing. So, thank you for that. Um, so I guess I'll start, I, I read somewhere where I was going to provide proven solutions uh, to a lot of the problems that people are dealing with. Well, sorry to disappoint, uh, and I'm not sure that we've proven anything at the Capital Group, but we are sort of working through these issues um, like the rest of you, and I'll try to, try to describe that. So um, what, I'm, what I want to kind of cover uh, today is uh, basically a few topics. I want to talk about what I call opti optimal trading strategies. Um, also would like to talk about sourcing block liquidity or the liquidity needs of the buy side and sort of how we think about it. I'll touch a little bit on market fragmentation and complexity and sort of what, what I, I consider that to be and some of the solutions we're thinking about dealing with it. And, and lastly, I'll touch a little bit on the idea of controlling costs from the buy side. And, you know, basically looking at commission budget shrinking, the ever-expanding technology budget. Um, so that is what I hope to accomplish. And uh, we'll see how it goes. The, uh, the, the, the basic fundamental objective, I think, of the buy side is to implement portfolio decisions with the least amount of friction. And hopefully that will maximize the returns that the clients and shareholders receive from the implementation process. Um, so in a stylized version of what I see as the true, well, let's, let's take a second here to talk about the trader's dilemma. So a dilemma is defined as a situation requiring a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. I thought that was pretty insightful in terms of what a, a buy-side trader deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. It's pretty much what everyone faces, you know. Uh, and to sort of describe what I think is one of the dilemmas here, I'll, I'll take a stylized view of it, and I'm sure this is familiar to a lot of folks. If you think about the trading decision and you, you look at it over a function of cost and time, what you have is, uh, in the first instance, impact cost. We want to certainly minimize impact cost, um, what it costs to get the decision into the portfolio. And you can see here, this is sort of a, 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 con, a concave function that shows, a uh, convex function that shows Impact costs can be reduced if you sort of spread out the implementation over time. The more urgent the order is, from, from the, the, the far uh, left-hand side of the axis, you can see the more it's going to cost you. And that just illustrates the liquidity needs of implementing a portfolio decision. The, the more liquidity you're going to demand, the more it's going to cost you. Simple, simple economic supply and demand. The other. Uh, component is um, opportunity risk. So in the same uh, dimension of cost and time, the longer you take to implement, you bring in more risk that the stock is going to trade away from you, 
either on its own because the market gets away or because uh, information leakage gets into the marketplace because of the large buyer sellers in it. So this is the dilemma. This is really what it is. And how do you, you know, optimize across those two undesirable choices, if you will? So the, the way that we've tried to address this at, uh, at Capital is thinking about uh, working with the portfolio manager. Because at the end of the day, it's all going to be dependent upon the investment thesis that really creates the most optimal picture. In some instances, you're going to want to increase cost because it's information driven and the stock it hasn't in, in, in embedded the, the information you think you have that other people don't. In other instances, it might be a liquidity decision and you have time to spread it out. So really understanding what the portfolio manager's thesis is is, is vital to that and we try to do that um, by engaging the portfolio manager in discussions and aligning our traders with different portfolio managers. Additionally important to that is sort of what the decisions of the portfolio manager typically are. And you can do this um, through some technology and some uh, analysis of previous history of portfolio management decisions and kind of look at what we call alpha profiling. So you can kind of see on average what the stock does after the portfolio manager puts in the order a few days out. And we equip the traders with that knowledge so that they can better prepare themselves for what to expect when the new order comes in. So, so uh, you know, you have this basic fundamental issue, um, but also in the marketplace, um, you know, you sort of have worries about liquidity. Now, one of the topics was a liquidity crunch. I I'm not sure that there's really a liquidity crunch. I, I would take a little bit of issue. This is a, Morgan Stanley prepared this for me, so I should credit them for the graph here. The, what this really shows is that over a long period of time, since 2003, you certainly had a spike in liquidity pre-crisis and then during the crisis, but really the volumes that we're at right now in, in 2014, the beginning of 2014, are very similar to what we saw in 04 and 05. Um, and, and, and those were elevated from levels in 01 and, and, and before. So I'm not sure that what we really have is a liquidity crunch necessarily, but I think the problem that we face today is sort of sourcing block liquidity. Um, and that's always been the case. I mean, I've been doing this for, for, for a lot longer than I like to uh, really think about. But, you know, sort of figuring out how to bring natural buyers and sellers together in, in block trading is really, really the, a, key, a key element of what I think the liquidity crunch is. And I think the market's evolution, the structure of the market that has changed, has, I think, contributed to this even more. And I'll, I'll try to touch on that a little bit more. But certainly, you know, this, this is a great example of what I think everyone's concern is when trying to source block liquidity. And that's, who, who knows what I've got? And when I'm playing poker, if someone's looking at my hand, you know, I'm dead. They're going to bid me up. I'm never going to be able to win a hand. And that's what you feel like day in and day out on the buy side's trading desk. Uh, and it's interesting because how people engage in negotiating block trading is, is, is also a real dilemma. And uh, I'll, try, I'll try to explain, I'll try to, try to demonstrate this with, you know, a, probably a very poor effort of describing what is an economic theory around uh, game theory. But I think it applies to block trading. So in, in, in a typical game theory, you have two players. Uh, the first player would be represented on the, the left-hand axis, and the second player would be represented across the top axis. And in negotiating a block trade, you sort of have two choices. You can disclose that you want to engage in a trade, or you can remain anonymous. That's, that's player one's choice. Player two has the same two choices. So, so here's where the dilemma is. In the first instance, where you have player one willing to disclose and player two willing to disclose, you, you come up with what I call this price equilibrium. I think it's, a, it's the best outcome for everybody. If you're both willing to kind of show your hand and get to the right price, you have the clearing price of a transaction, which in economics should be equilibrium. So on the second instance, where the player is willing to disclose, but the, but the second player remains anonymous, you sort of tip your hand. The guy sees your cards. So you have what I say in this instance, first player gets a price that's bad, and the second player gets a price that's good. Because 
He's tipped his hand. Now I know there's a large buyer. Information gets leaked, and the price moves away from the first player. Likewise, the, the same instance works the other way. So in both of these instances, the person who remains anonymous is rewarded with a better price. The person who discloses ends up getting a bad price. And then in the last instance, the, the, you both remain anonymous, uh, and then I, you get what I call a price neutral. You don't know whether you're going to be the best price, the worst price, but somewhere in between. Both players will probably get a very neutral price. And, you, and in every instance, in a possible outcomes, good price is certainly going to be the best outcome. Price equilibrium, I think, is the second best outcome. The neutral price is the third best outcome, and the bad price is the worst outcome. So it's optimal, if you will, and, and disclosing information increases the probability of information leakage, as I've described, and the rational choice is to remain anonymous. So that's what happens in today's world around you know, trying to source block liquidity, is people have this natural propensity to kind of remain anonymous. And we see this in the marketplace in a lot of different instances, not only in block trading, uh, uh, but also in the daily interactions we have in dark pools and algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, what we've tried to do, some of the initiatives that we've tried to really focus on in the last year or so at the Capital Group is sort of trying to uh, get over this dilemma and find, find ways to, to increase our ability to source block liquidity. And specifically, the, 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 the in initiatives that we've undertaken is um, a reworking of our indications of interest system. We came out with uh, a spec that sort of qualifies indications of interest so that our traders will know at the time of, at the, time of the decision that they're shown an the opportunity to trade a block where it's sourced from. Is it natural? Is it truly natural? And we defined what natural was as two parties. Is it principle, where the broker is taking on risk to offer me up this uh, block liquidity? Or is it what we call principle natural, which is where the broker is unwinding uh, risk to show us the block liquidity? And, and also, we've asked the brokers to kind of give us, if, on an unwind position, sort of what desk it's coming from. And that way, our traders have a higher probability of picking up the phone because they're not afraid to remain anonymous anymore because they have insight into what it is they're going to interact with. Uh, in, in addition to that, we've also uh, created the ability for our traders to sort of interact seamlessly with in indications that come in. So we're, we're starting to um, really use actionable IOIs to give the traders the ability to react anom anonymously and, and get a certainty of execution. And again, that certainty of execution, I think, drop some of the barriers you find uh, within this dilemma, as I've described it before, in this game theory outcome. The, uh, the, the complexity in the marketplace is another, another issue that we've been dealing with a lot. And I think that um, if, if you could hit this. So the, the, the people from Nanex, I love, I love their, their uh, visualization aids in this. This is, a, this is a, uh, a, a video of 1 20th of a second in trading in Nokia, slowed down so that we can watch it over the course of two minutes. And what you see here, all the, all the yellow dots, is when an order or a quote changes at one of the marketplaces, these messages go across the entire marketplace to all the different exchanges. And we can only fit, I think, 10 exchanges on this slide, but you can imagine in the US, 13 exchanges, 50 ATSs, uh, you know, it's, it's compounded even more. And really what this describes is a situation where you, you don't know where your order is. You can't even see at the time of uh, transacting in the marketplace the, the changes in the quotes, uh, where they're trading at and at what sizes, the velocity of trading has increased at such dramatic uh, speeds that it's very difficult to sort of understand what it is you're doing in the marketplace. And maybe I long for the old days. I remember when I started, you know, 30 years ago, 
you know, I had my Quotron, my, my rotary dial phone, and I could watch every print on the tape, and it was sort of easy, I guess. That's not the world today, and I think there's been a lot of efficiencies from the market structure that we have today, but I do think that the complexity around figuring out who sees your order, where it is, is, is one of the major challenges that faces the buy side today. Um, and we're, we're trying to work um, diligently so that we can equip our traders to better cope with this complexity. And a lot of it has to do with um, transparency around where our orders are executed, transparency around uh, where our orders are routed. Um, we've done a lot of work with our brokers in, in talking to them about their order routing practices and who it is they're connected to. Um, so tr trying to understand the web of the marketplace is, is really the challenge uh, of, of tomorrow. And the initiatives that we're, go we're, we're working with right now have to do with bringing to the traders information in real time through visualization techniques and large data and data, uh, you know, data visualization tools to help them understand in real time uh, how their orders are transacting in the marketplace. The, 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 uh, the last thing I'll touch on um, quickly is sort of these efforts, what they cost, what the, what the impact is um, in working with brokers today and how you, how, how you manage the costs around it. And I, I think that everyone is faced with the challenge of um, shrinking commission budgets and technology spend. So for us, um, I, you know, what we're really trying to focus in on again, I think, is transparency with our brokers and, and sort of have a, a very good dialogue with them around the resources that we consume from them and how that relates to uh, the amount of business that we're doing with them. And, and it really has to do with the vote and really understanding that the investment group can uh, be held accountable for what, they're, for what they're spending and that the brokers are then just supplying us with the right amount of resources that we want to consume. Uh, and and that's, that's an ongoing effort and, and, and you know, and I, and I think it's being driven a lot by changes in regulation, especially in the UK uh, with the unbundling efforts by the FCA. Uh, additionally, the, and then the last, last thing I'll just touch on here in the last minute or two that I have is in, 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 in the, the, the way that we've tried to deal with the technology spend associated with trying to handle complexity, trying to deal with sourcing block liquidity, um, really demands that we be a lot more efficient than we've ever been in terms of trying to figure out what it is that's important and what it isn't. And so we've gone to great lengths over the last uh, couple of years to develop um, what we call our business technology roadmap, where the businesses trading is responsible to sort of diagram out exactly what it is, figure out where it is that they add value, and then try to figure out what technologies can be um, used in those places where we add value so that we can pinpoint the right technology spend because there's a myriad of choices out there. And trying to control uh, <laughs> everything that you need on today's trading desk in a complex world is really a challenge, I think, for all of us. I think we'd all, all find that to be true. So I, I finished a couple minutes early. I hope. I was afraid of that. Sure. Um, so I'll throw it open to the audience now. Does anybody have any questions? We've got people with mics that can roam the room. Can I see any hands going up? OK, let me ask you a question. So you've talked about one of the issues that we hear about a lot from the buy side, which is the ability to source block liquidity. Right, and the improvements that you've made in being able to categorize IOIs as, as one way to kind of help facilitate that with natural IOIs and principal natural and so on. Um, do you think it's getting easier or harder to source block liquidity yeah, I think it's and a get lot those harder. trades off? Right? I, I because think the market's obviously becoming increasingly complex. So the improvements that you were talking about there, is it making it easier or harder Well, right we've now? had some success. Uh, it's, it's, it's still... If you, if you look, and we, you know, we don't have great statistics going back 
uh, a, long, just a long time, but in the last three years, uh, our ability to source block liquidity is sort of at the low point we've seen uh, on average relative to the rest of our trades um, than it's ever been. So uh, it is a challenge, and you know, hope we're still in the midst of, of um, implementing the initiative, and we, we hope that improves, and we've seen some early success, so I don't know. I, I think that there's real, uh, as I described, real problems in the marketplace with people wanting to trade block liquidity, and I think people have to get over that, and they have to find ways to disclose a little bit, as I've described. You, 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 know, you, have to, you have to show a little to get a little, and I think people have to be a little more willing to do that. And I think in a low volatility environment, it's easier to do. If we get in a high volatility environment, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's improved somewhat, certainly from the, the heights of the volatility we saw. Okay. And do you think the fear and the kind of anxiety that exists around HFT as one of the kind of newer participants that's come into the market as it's fragmented in both the US and, and Europe, um, whether it's perception or reality, um, is reducing, you know, the buy side's desire to show their hand a little bit more. And, you know, how do you perceive the impact of, of that in the marketplace? Well, you know, it's almost the, it's almost the opposite, that the inability or the reluctance to um, try to negotiate large block liquidity has forced people into operating in venues that trade at very, very small sizes and at very rapid paces. So th really, it, it, it is a, the perfect environment for the electronic market making to take place. So I, I, I don't, I don't there's, there's a little bit of a loaded question in there in terms of the, the negativity around high frequency trading. I don't, I don't think high frequency trading in and of itself is bad. Um, I think they serve sort of a, a, a good purpose in the marketplace to, um, but, but the, the, the perverse nature of the market and the way that it's fragmented and become complex really sort of leads to, I think, some fundamental conflicts of interest where um, certain market participants are given advantages over others. And I think you have to watch for that. And I think that's what you need to control for. And that's, that's sort of what a buy side trader has to worry about when entering into any venue to execute and you know, who's seeing it, who's on the other side. These are the questions that are, are, are critical to, to making sure that that implementation is, is optimal. Can't see if any hands are up in the, uh, in the audience for a final question. Nope. Okay, great. Well, thank you very Thanks. much, Matt. Give him a round of applause.